Thanks for tuning in to the IGM podcast. We're so glad you've decided to explore God's word with us. We look forward to connecting with you in email at info at or online at our website, www.integritygm.com. We hope this podcast encourages you to grow in the knowledge of God through his word. Be blessed. Blessings to everyone today in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. Today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 13. Alan and I just finished the end of chapter 12, so we're ready to go right into chapter 13. And remember, in the original letters, there's not chapter and verse division. So what is being said in chapter 12 is flowing into chapter 13. At the end of chapter 12, it's talking about not taking vengeance for yourself. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. And God is the one who will repay. And don't be overcome by evil, by doing evil, but overcome evil by doing what is right. Doing what is right is reflecting God's character in everything that we do. That is coming into this understanding of government. Chapter 13 of Romans is one of the most discussed chapters that people argue about. What are we talking about in chapter 13? It's very simple and it's very plain as we go through it. And what Paul is saying is consistent throughout Scripture. You have to remember the historical context as well. And the historical context makes it very difficult to follow the words of Paul that is writing to the believers at Rome. Because during this time, the government is persecuting anyone who names the name of Christ. It is not a legal recognized religion within the Roman Empire. Later on, people are going to have their properties confiscated because they named the name of the Messiah or the name of Christ. They are saying Yeshua is the Messiah, Jesus is the Christ. The emperor is demanding worship to himself. Believers are not giving him that honor and that respect. The empire is saying that Believers cannot congregate together. They cannot assemble together. Now, this is going to come about eight years later after this letter is written to the believers within Rome, within the city of Rome. However, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews is going to say, do not be like some that have developed this habit of forsaking the assembling together. Do not be like them. You are not to forsake the assembling together. Because you have to remember, God's authority is always greater than any other authority. It's greater than the authority of government. It's greater than the authority even within a marriage. And so God always has the greatest and the final authority in everything that we do as followers of Christ. So as we're coming into chapter 13, the believers are being persecuted by government. So what he is saying has such an impact upon them beyond what we can understand within Western civilization. Because I never grew up in a governmental culture where I was being attacked by the government. In fact, in America, we have a constitution that gives us the freedom of speech, the freedom to own our own weapons, the freedom to assemble together, the freedom to speak what we believe what is true and to live our lives according to our own convictions and faith. But now in 2021, all of that is changing. And they're coming after us in our faith and telling us what we can say, what we can do, and they're trying to control everything within our lives. So chapter 13 is becoming more relevant to us today. When I say relevant, relevant as it was in the first century. I mean, we're not even close to where they were, but we can see the conflict within us more today than, say, 30 years ago. And so... That doesn't change the Word of God. And we're going to flow into this chapter, flowing from chapter 12 into chapter 13. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those who exist are established by God. And let's talk about governing authorities over us. 
one governing authority that God gives to us, mankind, is marriage and the family. When we look at marriage, isn't marriage instituted by God? Yes. Does that mean that every marriage is a good marriage? No. Does that mean that every marriage brings about honor to God? No, it doesn't. So because there is a bad marriage, does that mean that we throw away the institution of marriage? Absolutely not. Now, we're living in a culture today that's trying to redefine marriage and trying to throw away the biblical understanding of marriage. But as believers, we understand that marriage is instituted by God and is a governing authority over our lives. What about government? As we go through the book of Genesis, we see governing authorities that are greater than a father and a mother over children because families in time became nations. In fact, when you look at the understanding to Abraham, Abraham, through you, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. The actual understanding of that, all the families of the earth shall be blessed, but family units became nations. So just like you see governing authorities within the family, and as families grow and people groups grow, they have governing authorities that God has instituted to govern people. So the same principle that you have within the family also is in a greater context as we look at nations. When we look at towns and cities, and we look at regions and districts, and we look at nations, and we look at empires, there are governing authorities that people have within their lives. All right, so keep that in mind. So if we're in a good government or a bad government, one we like or one that we do not like, just like in a family and in a marriage, it's still the same principle. They are governing authorities that God has instituted to be over us. And it's the institution. It doesn't mean it's the particular people that are doing evil. But the institution comes from God. Just like marriage comes from God, governing authorities over culture and civilizations come from God. I'll ask you a curveball question, Scott, here. So I'm just thinking of North Korea right now. I think everyone in the world can agree that's a bad government body that's going on there that's evil and a lot of wrong things. So I guess to just see if I'm understanding it right. So that's an institution that's that's established by God, but this regime is perverting this institution and using it for evil and it's turned into an evil demonic thing in the world that's that's world known, you know, by, by almost everybody, Christian and non Christian is being bad. So in that context of, of that example that's still ordained by God, this government, this institution, but the people the institution, in it, but yeah. the people in it, the regime leaders there are not because they're not obviously not following God and they're doing evil. Yeah, if someone will think and break it down to a governing authority over children, you have a husband and a wife, and they are together as one, and they have children. Say the husband is physically abusive, verbally abusive. He's a father, and it can even be sexually abusive, and how horrible that is. And you feel bad for those children. We feel bad for the people in North Korea that they have to be under such an evil empire. But think about a child that is under abuse sexually, physically, verbally, in every single way, and we feel terrible for them, and we do everything to get them out, if it's known, out of that governing authority over them. However, we don't throw away the institution of marriage and family just because there's a horrible father. In the same way in North Korea, or let's use a better one, China, you know, China that uh, has a million people. I'm not saying a better one. I'm saying the same type. But we don't think of China in the same context of North Korea. They have millions of people in concentration camps in China. All right. They force people to get abortions. They have a one child and now a two child policy. And you go beyond that, they will bring you in and kill that child, murder that child. So 
we look at China, we look at North Korea, we look at the former Soviet Union, we look at these evil empires, and I have no problem of calling them evil, and I don't have any problem of looking at the Roman Empire at this time, and it was evil. And looking at it and calling it what it is, and we pray and we hope that the people within those lands can get out of that governing authority. But once they get out of that governing authority and they replace it with another, hopefully those governors will be better to the people and they will represent them in a better way. But just because China's evil doesn't mean that we throw away government. And, and this is another thing for people to think about. You can never throw away government. Think about anarchists. Anarchists don't believe in government. And in our own country recently, out in the state of Washington, I think it was in Seattle, these anarchists finally took over a portion of the city. And what, what did they do immediately? They set up barriers and walls and developed a government. What is government? Making rules for what you can do and cannot do as a society. So everyone that was within those barriers, they were under what? government. Even these guys, or whoever they were, were anarchists. They don't believe in government. They became a government to themselves. You will never escape government at all. There will be governing authorities over us as a society. From that perspective, government is instituted by God just in the same way the family is and marriage is. Let's go to verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. What is that ordinance? That God gives us governing authorities. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So believers within the Roman Empire that are persecuting them, they must understand that governing authorities comes from God. Once we understand that, we can react better to the evil that is coming against us. How do we react to evil? Not repaying evil with evil, but overcoming evil by doing what is good. Because that governing authority is instituted by God. Those principles are governing over you. Verse 3. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. That's the reason why they exist. That if there's evil going on, they are to execute the sword. We're going to see here in a moment. They are to take care of evil. The problem is in the Roman Empire, they're saying that the believers are evil. But we do not overcome evil with evil. We overcome evil with doing what is good. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise for the same. In time, as you do what is good, feed those that are hungry, your enemy. Give water to those who are thirsty. This is your enemy. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil by doing what is good. Love those that hate you. Bless those that curse you. This is the response to our government. The same principles are being established by Paul with government. Verse 4, for it is a minister of God. Let me back up. So in time, this is the way that you change the hearts of people, is by doing what is right. Okay, now let's go to verse 4. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Government has the right to bring vengeance upon the people that they are governing because they are the ones that have the authority to have the sword. Now, this is very important. Because we have a lot of Christians that say, they go to the Sermon on the Mount and they say, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That goes back to the law of Moses. That principle was never for individual vengeance. That was always for society and how to govern how to govern over a society. But 
at the time of Jesus, they had taken those principles and applied it to themselves that I have a right for vengeance, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's in the wrong context. Go back to chapter 12. Vengeance belongs to God. Chapter 13, God is saying, governing authorities, I have given the power to them to govern, and they have the ability to have the sword and to execute judgment. Now think about this for a moment. If someone kills my son or my daughter, murders them, do I have a right to murder them as well? No, I have a right to defend against an attack from them, and it might kill them in the process, but that's not murder if I'm defending. But say my son or my daughter is murdered by an individual, I do not have the authority to go in to take their life. That would be murder in itself. Who has the authority? The governing authorities have the right to judge them, to make a judgment, and to decide whether this person should live or die, if they're guilty or not guilty. Okay, And so Christians that say, well, we should not have the death penalty, that's evil because we're Christians and government should not have the right, is going against what Paul is saying here. They do have the right to punish evil. They do have a right to execute the sword. Okay, they do have that right. That's their authority, and God recognizes that authority. Now, think about this. Romans chapter 8, the Roman Empire is saying that believers can be executed. If we read at what's taking place, and this is 57 AD, they're a saying Paul is saying, we are like sheep that are led to the slaughter. All day long, we are being put to death. Believers are being killed by the Roman authorities for their faith. Okay, That's evil coming against us, pure evil, just like you see in China or North Korea, how believers can be killed for their faith. Throw, throw Iran in there, too. Yes, <laughs> Iran, any Islamic country, anywhere that you go, as a believer, you have to be very careful. How do we respond to that evil? How do we overcome that evil? By not picking up the sword and developing armies to go after that army to kill them, you may have to defend yourself against an attack. If anyone attacked my family, of course I'm going to defend them. Do what I can, but that's not evil to do that. But I'm not going to come and try to kill them that's coming against me. I'm going to overcome evil by doing good. No, that really makes a lot of sense for me now, especially when you flow into it from chapter 12, because he's really saying, yeah, this is an, an ordinance that's set up by God. But if you have a North Korea or an Iran or something that is actually doing evil, how do you fight it? You overcome it. Yes. By doing good, you overcome it by doing what's right. And like you said, eventually over time, maybe that changes. Maybe you get to see the vengeance exacted on this regime or this government, but maybe right. you don't. Maybe that's an eternity, but we're still called to do good, to stay under this authority in the context of, yeah, it's not going against something that God is telling us to do or has told us to do in his word. Yes. And the question that comes into a lot of people's minds, can we ever rebel against a governing authority? Yes. Think about America. What we were saying to England and the British Empire is that we no longer want to be under your governing authority, and we created our own authority, which meant that we got attacked, and we had to defend ourselves against an authority that's saying, no, we are your authority, and we're not giving up this right. So sometimes it brings forth conflict, but it wasn't the early colonies saying that we're throwing away government. They're saying that we're not willing to have government without representation. And so sometimes there's a conflict. Sometimes in China, there was an uprising in which the Chinese army slaughtered thousands of people. They were uprising, asking for change. What are they, what are they saying? We want another governing authority over us. We do not want the Communist Party over us. And they paid a price with their lives. And so I'm not saying that we cannot switch to a different government. 
that we cannot pray for a different government. When evil is there, it is evil, and it's a life and death situation. But how we respond to it is always doing what is right, always striving to honor God in the things that we do. Very difficult at times. No one said that the life of following Christ is an easy life. You're to deny yourself, take up your own cross, and follow him. Verse 5, therefore it is necessary to be in subjection. Not only because of wrath, not only because of the judgment that the government can bring, but also for conscience sake. And Paul talks about this conscience about all the way through this letter to the Romans. For because of this, verse 6, you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. So for conscience sake, if I'm not paying my taxes and I'm not abiding by the laws, I'm not doing what is right, there's within myself, I have a conscience that's telling me that this is wrong. And as I'm going against that, my faith is being attacked from my own actions of what I am doing. And so when he says in verse 5, for conscience sake, I believe it's talking about our own conscience here. So I say I'm a believer, but I'm cheating on my taxes, and I'm not paying taxes, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing that, and I'm not following the temporary aspects of government and what they're saying for me to do. Then there's a problem here. Again, I believe this is in the context of things that do not question the authority of God. Because if government says we cannot assemble together, in Hebrews, we are not to forsake the assembling together. If the government says that I cannot call on the name of Christ and say that Jesus is the Messiah, then they have overstepped their boundaries because then that becomes an issue of my faith. In the same way, if you're not understanding what I'm saying, if a husband tells his wife to cheat on the taxes for the family, that wife is to be in subjection to her husband, but at that point, the husband is challenging the authority of God within her life. And she is to say to her husband, no, I cannot do that. I cannot lie. I cannot cheat. I cannot steal because that is my relationship with my God. If I tell my children to go steal something in a store, they have every right to look to me as a father and say, Father, I cannot do that. That's dishonest. So what we're dealing with are the temporary things, taxes and laws that do not put us in conflict with our relationship with God. That is true in the home. It is true within the government, whether it's a city government, a state government, or a federal government. The only time I'm going to go against their authority is when they challenge the authority of God. I think this brings up a question, at least in my mind. Maybe someone else is thinking it. You know, say you are in China or Iran and you need to pay these taxes to this government that you know is doing evil things, that you know is murdering innocent people, that money you're sending them is going for these different things that are not of God. How do you go in these verses in that context, in that sort of mindset? Because it's sort of a it's a catch-22, you know, you want, you want to give it, and I think Paul here is saying to do that because this government ordinance is from God, whether or not the people there are and are living right. So how, in your conscience, do you argue that and say... This is what I should do to give that to them, even though I know this is going to do things that are evil. Well, let's look at verse 7 and then look at the context that they were in, and then let's look at it today. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Let's stop there. At this time, the military of the Roman Empire is killing believers. Later on, Nero's going to put believers on crosses and burn them. So by paying tax to the Romans, you are actually funding the military that is executing the sword against the believers. But what is Paul saying? He is saying, tax to whom tax is due. Now they ask the same thing of Jesus as well about paying taxes, he says, let me see the coin. Whose image is on that? Give to Caesar, which belongs to Caesar. Give to God, which belongs to God. 
think about the American government. We don't even have to go to the Chinese or the Iranians at this point. In certain administrations, like the one we're under now, they are taking our tax money and funding it to Planned Parenthood and funding it into abortions around the world. What do I do as a believer? Knowing that, I know that, just like the believers at Rome. And remember, these believers are in the heart of the persecution because they are in the city of Rome. What do I do? Do I pay my tax to Rome, who is executing evil against my own faith? That's the same thing I'm dealing with right now. This is an issue of my faith in so many ways. Do I pay tax or I do not pay tax? I believe that we're to pay tax. It's almost when you when you bring up the example of what Jesus talked about, in a way saying these are just temporal things. This is Caesar's, this is a coin, give it to him, what's due to him. And it's kind of Paul's almost saying that just for your conscience sake and for doing what's right to this ordinance, not that it's the right people that are acting out on that ordinance or acting out of this government. But yeah, this is temporal and just give that to them because that's the doing good part and the vengeance is the Lord's and keeping a few thousand dollars a year doesn't really move the needle on what the U.S. government's going to do. They don't care, really. It won't affect them, but it will affect our conscience and in our walk with the Lord if we're holding that back, knowing that we're doing something wrong, or, yes. you know, essentially stealing money from the government by not paying our taxes. Right. And we can um, go to prison. We can lose everything. That's not necessarily the issue. The issue is doing what is right and thinking about what is the right thing to do in God's eyes. I remember one time I was in the uh, country of Nepal, and we're out in West Nepal, and we're traveling over these roads that don't even exist. But about every 30 minutes, we have to stop and pay a road tax. <laughs> and I remember, with a smile on my face, saying to the Nepalese, the two policemen there, we're paying the road tax, but where's the road? And they just smiled. Now, what do I do there? I know there's corruption, but they have a governmental road tax that I'm paying about every 30 minutes to an hour on a road that does not exist. And I know it's going into their pockets. I know probably 70, 80 percent of it's going into corruption. I paid the tax and I paid it the next 30 minutes. And an hour later, I paid an another road tax. And we laugh about it because it is kind of funny. Some of these issues are not funny, but I'm going to pay the tax. And this is how I would interpret this. Some may disagree with me on these things, but I'm going to pay my tax, even to an evil government. I'm going to give honor to whom honor is due, fear to whom fear. Government has the ability to execute the sword, and I'm going to give honor to those that stand in a position of authority over me. The only time that I'm not going to honor them is when they make me choose between my relationship and my honor to God and my honor to them. And so some of you may say, but if I pay my tax, then I feel like I'm dishonoring God. I don't think Paul sees it that way. I do not think Jesus sees it that way. In fact, the ones that are going to give the final authority to execute him was Rome. Because the Jewish nation could not do that. They had lost that authority. So he is saying to that coin, give to Caesar which belongs to Caesar, give to God which belongs to God. What Paul is saying, render to all what is due them, tax to whom taxes due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Jesus is saying, yes, you pay your tax to the very ones that are going to execute him. Yeah, and, and as, you, as you go through this, and I think looking in context of what Rome was doing at the time, and Paul's talking about this during that evil Roman Empire that was murdering Christians. But also, you know, we go back, if you go back to chapter 12, loving and without hypocrisy and, and, and the things we talked about in the last podcast, you know, by not doing this or paying your taxes, you're opening the door for non-Christians or people that are coming against you to attack you and say, well, look, you don't even pay your taxes. You don't even do this, and you call yourself a Christian. And I think at a certain point that dishonors the name of God or it can, or they can call that out to you. So it's almost more important to follow this ordinance, even though the, the people enacting it are evil. Um, and we still see that today. But 
going with God's ordinance, paying the tax, because it, it closes the door for people to come against you and blaspheme the name of Christ and say, look yes. at you Christians, you don't even pay your taxes, you're stealing and you're doing this, and, and we're not even Christian, but we know we should pay this. Yes. And I think it's the lesser of two evils. I don't know if that's a good way to, to well, phrase think, this. Yeah, think of it in this way. Take believers uh, in India. And they're under heavy persecution, but I truly believe the best citizens in India are the Christians. You know, they're about 50 million strong, 50 plus million strong. And if you had to look at the different societies between Muslims and Hindus and Jains and Buddhists and Christians, when you look at who is really the strongest people as far as following the laws of the land, paying their taxes and things of that nature, I would say it's the Christian community. Now, there are some that would say within India, no, we're going to have two sets of books like everybody else, and we're not going to report the right income, and we are going to do things like everybody else. But the majority of them have the mindset, let's do what is right, let's give tax, even though we know it's going into corruption, a lot of it, And let's have a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by doing what is good. And by doing that, I believe that they are planting seeds into the hearts of Hindus and Muslims and Jains and Buddhists and other groups within that society. These people are people that give honor to whom honor is due, fear to whom they need to fear. They pay tax on their income. They do what is right within their businesses. And what are they leaving? They are leaving a witness behind, and they're also keeping coals upon the heads of people that are doing evil against them. See, chapter 12 and 13, you cannot separate these chapters. They're flowing together. And we've always got to think about our witness. And I agree with you. If we're not paying our taxes, when we're not doing the things that we're supposed to be doing, even though they may not be doing it themselves, they have an accusation against us. These people do not support the government. They're evil people. We need to get rid of them. How are we going to make a difference by doing what is right? Yeah, and I think we we get confused and have our own idea of what our testimony should be, where I think Paul here lays it out pretty clearly that you should pay these taxes. And and I'm reminded of a a pastor that came and spoke at church I attended a while back. He did ministry in China, and he made a call at the end, and he said, you know, if you're in here and you do business, please pray about coming to China because the Chinese Christians there don't know how to do honest business, and they've never seen it, and we need witnesses to go there, show them this, and to show them how to walk, you know, in Christ in the workplace and, and how this is acted out. Yeah, and like you said, that's that's a testimony. And some people may not understand that. It's the same concept in India. How do you have a Christian business in India when the governing authorities are going to ask for a bribe? They're going to come around and ask for bakshish, and they're going to bakshish, say, uh, money under the table. If not, they'll close you down. All these kind of things are realities of Christians in China, in India, and in different parts of the world that we don't experience many times here in the West. So how do we do that? A lot of prayer, a lot of thinking things through, and the question is, God, what honors you? And that's the thing that we have to keep at the forefront. So say when we were in India, to give an example, and hopefully people will understand this and not think uh, badly about us, but every so often the postman would come to our house during certain times, and they would ask for a tip, okay? They're asking for a tip. Mm -hmm. But that's not a tip. Actually, it's a bribe. If we don't give them some money, then they're not going to bring us our mail. Our mail is not going to arrive to the house. It will not come. If you send a package to us, a letter, it's not going to come. So how do I, how do I deal with that? From my perspective, they're asking for a tip, and I give that to him. He's responsible for what he does with that. Now, he's supposed to bring it back and share it with everybody and these kind of things, but he's going to put it in his pocket. So from my perspective, I would give him the tip, knowing that he's going to take that and probably put it in his pocket, but he's responsible for what he's doing with that. And I was okay with that. Someone from the outside might say, oh, you're paying a bribe. 
from my perspective, I'm giving him some money to make sure that I get good service to this place. It's like a payment that you would pay to a business. But yes, he's going to go and put it in his pocket. So these are difficult questions that believers deal with in China, India, Islamic countries, any dictatorship or anything of that nature. How do you operate a Christian business within that culture? You really have to just pray, seek God, and work through these issues in your own mind, but make sure what you're doing, that you feel comfortable that it is honoring God. And they always say in India, when you go to India, if you're black and white about everything, you'll not survive in India. And I think this is what this pastor was saying. When you go to China, we need people that come that knows how to operate a Christian business within China because you're going to be faced with a hundred different things that you're going to have to pray through. Look at God's Word. And I was comfortable with every two to three times a year of giving a tip to my postman. I was okay with that because he's responsible for what he does with that. Yeah, you're right. It's not always black and white, even though we want it to be. But God's Word's true, and, and we can find the answers in there. And it, and I think you're, you're right. It takes some time just seeking Him. And to me, it goes back to this conscience sake, too. Praying about it, seeking God, reading it through, and knowing in your heart that you've made the best decision right. you know that you could make at the time. And, and maybe that changes in 10 right. years, and you say, you know what, I shouldn't have done that. But at that time, for your conscience sake, and you really feel like you've done what's right, you know, and honored God with it. Because it may not be crystal clear, and, and things we're going to face in the future may not always be clear and exactly know what's right. There might be two sides of the argument coming from, from our brothers and sisters in Christ, and both of them may have great points. But it's our responsibility to know in our heart that we've made the best choice. Yes, and I always tell people that have a problem with that, okay, you go and live in India for 11 years, and then then we'll talk about it. When I have a policeman that stops me, and I know that he wants money, and he asks for my driver's license, I take it out, and I hold on to it. I don't allow him to get it. And I had one policeman try to rip it out of my hand, and he couldn't get it out, and he just finally left. And he would say, give me your license. I said, here it is, but I'm holding on to it. Because I know if he gets it, the only way to get my license back is I'm going to have to give him some money. So these are things that Christians around the world deal with with governing authorities every day, and every situation is a little bit different, and you've got to really be ready for it all the time. But the heart is always to do the right thing. So when we go through this, let's look at verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Well, what about the first part? Love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, strength. Well, that's a given. Who is he writing to? He's writing to believers here. So he's talking about relationships between each other. So our responsibility is to love one another. Verse 9, for this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is in how we react to everybody else. We're flowing out of the love of God, which is within us because we love God, we're going to love others. That's what we owe to people. Verse 10, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So as I'm looking at what I need to do in a government or an empire that is evil, what is my response? To love with the love of God. And love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. I'm always looking at what is best for others, doing what is right, treating them in the way that I should treat them. Do this knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. Every day that we live, we're getting closer to the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrection, and our salvation is nearer to us than we, when we believed. Now, that's almost 2,000 years ago. We can make that statement in such a more powerful way today 
that knowing this time that we're living in right now, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. Now, I think that is a reference to the resurrection there because our salvation is coming. It's closer now than when we first believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. What is the night? The evil time in which they're living in. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us, as followers of Christ, be ready to do what is right at all times, even in a government that is instituted by God. Their authority is instituted by God that is doing evil against us. Be willing to put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing, drunkenness, sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife, not in jealousy. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. What are we responsible for? Following Christ. What do we have the freedom to do? Follow Christ. What is the privilege that we have is to honor God, minister to others, love others, even to pay our taxes to government that is bringing evil against us. We're going to do what is right. We are going to put on the armor of light. And we're not going to give in to the things of this world. We're not going to be consumed into the lust of this world. Now, if we're trying to overcome evil by doing evil, what's going to happen to us? We're going to be pulled into that evil. But if we overcome evil by doing what is right then we can live in victory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think it's so powerful here at the end that Paul Paul's always the realist in his, in his writings, but he brings it back to eternal things, you know, that this is a temporal life that we're living in and that the night's almost gone and that we're going to be in this salvation and be with Christ and resurrected with Him and spend eternity with Him. So, you know, whether your government is enacting things according to what God wants or they're doing evil, you know, whether we're getting justice in this world from the government or injustice, it doesn't really matter because what we're responsible for is honoring Him and looking at things from the eternal perspective. And and I challenge myself with that. You know, it's easy these days, especially with everything you see in the country that we live in, to get really fired up about things that are happening in government and what people are saying and just the whole shift that you see. But my focus has to be on what's eternal and has to be on honoring God and not getting caught up in these minor arguments and just letting it fester with bitterness or strife or being envious. Whatever it is, I have to look at this is not my my permanent home in this 80, 90, 150, however many years the Lord chooses to give me is such a drop in the bucket to eternity with Him and honoring His name and also the people that can come with us as we are a testimony to Christ that see us living out, honoring God, that, you know, see something like that. And, you know, we talked about Paul and Stephen, and when Stephen was stoned, Saul was there, who eventually became Paul, and that's just so powerful that that testimony he had to speak truth and to stand for what was right brought the greatest writer of the New Testament, great apostle that, that won many souls to the Lord. So it brings it back, and this is that's what it's about. It's not about the government, and it's not about us getting what we want or getting justice. They were getting executed. People in Rome were getting killed, and they would get killed even further, like you said, in the next seven, eight years. But our responsibility is eternal, to honor God and to honor His name. And eventually, He honors us through eternity and the resurrection. I think that's the best way to wrap it up, is to say, as believers, we're living for the eternal things of God, and we're citizens of His kingdom first and foremost. And the temporary things of man's kingdoms is not the focus of our lives. If we can keep that in perspective then everything that Paul is saying here becomes much more easy to live. It's about God, his kingdom, his righteousness, and God knows how to take care of us. And if God allows a great persecution to come upon us, I can trust in him 
and I can still sleep at night, and I can still, even if I'm in a prison, have a smile on my face and joy in my heart, and I can be singing songs and praises and hymns unto God about the midnight hour like Paul and Silas was doing. And we can see that. We can have that mentality if we live for the eternal things of God. And God will help us to know how to deal with governing authorities that are doing evil against us and doing evil things against our convictions. God will help us to know how to handle that at the right time. And I'm going to pay my taxes and I'm going to say, yes, sir. I'm going to be have used honorific language for those in authority over me. And I'm going to pray for those that are in authority over me. And I'm going to bless those who curse me. And I'm going to love those who hate me. And I'm not going to be overcome by evil, but I'm going to overcome evil by doing what is good. That's who we are as believers. But we have to have the eternal things of God in focus in everything that we're doing in order to see that accomplished. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for chapter 12 and 13 of this letter that Paul wrote to the believers at Rome. Let these principles and what you meant, Lord, let it be applied to our hearts today and what it means for us today. Thank you, God, that your word is true. It does not change because, God, you do not change and your character doesn't change and your word does not change. And, God, we stand upon your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to learn more about IGM or have any questions about this podcast, feel free to reach out to us at info at integritygm.com. And connect with us on Instagram at Integrity underscore Global and Facebook at Integrity Global Missions. If you like our podcast, please share it and leave a review. Thank you for listening. Have a blessed day.